As the world has emerged from the COVID-19 pandemic, inflation has risen dramatically. Governments are printing more money than ever before. Will inflation keep rising? And how will it affect the economy? This video presents a brief overview of the economics of inflation. Topics covered include the advantages and disadvantages of inflation, how inflation is measured, the different types of inflation, economic factors affecting inflation, how cryptocurrencies and investments influence, infl influence inflation and vice versa, and the future of inflation. Inflation is the general increase in the prices of goods and services. The price of money can be measured in terms of the goods and services that it can buy, its purchasing power. Over time, this purchasing power declines, thus it takes more money to buy the same basket of goods and services. These are the three primary measures of inflation. The CPI measures inflation of consumer goods and services, while the GDP deflator measures inflation of all goods and services, including purchases by businesses and governments. The Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index is similar to the CPI, but it is based on a slightly broader basket of goods and services, on different prices for some items, and on different weights used to aggregate the items. Because it includes a broader range of goods and services, the Federal Reserve prefers this measure as a better indication of inflation. Over the past 20 years, the CPI inflation averaged about 2%, while the PCEPI inflation averaged about 1.8% slightly lower. However, the CPI is the most common measure of inflation, widely used as a cost of living index to adjust Social Security and other government payments. Believe it or not, inflation also has some benefits. It helps to finance the government, since the government prints the money. Without this seniorage, the government would have to collect that money as taxes which in the United States amounts to about $600 billion. It can also be used as a monetary policy tool to optimize the economy. Inflation can also adjust sticky prices in relation to other prices. Many people do not want to accept lower prices, such as lower prices for homes or lower wages. Hence, these prices do not decline with lower demand as other goods and services. So without inflation, their costs will grow out of proportion compared to other expenses. Inflation helps to normalize these prices. Of course, inflation has disadvantages. Uncertain inflation increases planning risks, especially for businesses. Inflation also redistributes the wealth. People with assets become richer. People with fixed incomes become poorer. Debtors profit over creditors. The costs of inflation include a decreasing value of money as a store of value, decreasing the convenience of money, increased menu costs, and economic distortions caused by the uneven influence of inflation on different products and services. There are also factors that mitigate inflation damage. Inflation changes behavior that mitigates inflation to some extent. Higher prices reduce demand, so people save money by not buying so much. People also buy cheaper substitutes. This substitution effect mitigates or eliminates the loss of purchasing power from inflation. Prices may rise because of quality improvements, so purchasing power may be maintained or even increased, even if nominal prices are higher. People adjust to Anticipated inflation by asking for raises. Lenders add an inflation premium to their interest rate on loans to compensate them for the increased inflation. Inflation for consumer purchases is measured by the Consumer Price Index, or CPI. Calculating the CPI is complex based on statistics, and there are several versions, so this explanation is grossly simplified. The CPI is based on an index calculated from a consumer market basket consisting of what consumers typically bought and how much they paid. 
This index is arbitrarily set to 100 for average prices that prevailed from 1982 to 1984. Increases in inflation are measured by comparing the current index to some previous index, usually the previous year. In May 2021, the index was about 269, meaning that something that cost $1 in 1984 now costs $2.69. Many factors such as the money supply influence inflation but the direct cause of inflation is businesses raising prices. Demand pool inflation occurs when demand suddenly increases, forcing businesses to raise prices because the cost of producing more to meet demand increases, such as using marginal resources to increase production and paying overtime for labor. Demand pool inflation increases with the velocity of money, which I will discuss later. Cost push inflation occurs when businesses raise prices because the factors of production have increased in price, such as raw materials and labor. Cost push inflation may also occur when some businesses or organizations want to take advantage of the inelasticity of demand for their product or service, where raising prices will directly increase their revenue and profits. Because demand and supply differ for different goods and services, and because changes in their demand and supply differ. Different goods and services have different rates of inflation. For instance, gas prices in 2021 increased more than 56% from 2020, and prices for used cars and trucks increased by 30% in the same time period. By contrast, medical care services only increased by 1.5% in spite of the COVID-19 pandemic. Prices are set at the market equilibrium of supply and demand, when the amount demanded equals the amount supplied. Over the short term, supply is inelastic. That means that when demand suddenly rises from D1 to D2, then suppliers can't increase supply because they don't have enough time. So the only thing they can change is the price. Fast increases in demand cause higher prices because suppliers do not have enough time to increase the quantity, but they can inqu quickly increase the prices. For instance, Uber developed a policy of surge pricing, increasing prices when demand increased. Uber can do this because when people need taxi services, prices do not matter nearly as much as getting prompt service, especially when many people suddenly want to use taxi services such as during a snowstorm or after a major concert. But in the long run, prices for specific goods and services tends to moderate as more competitors enter the market and each supplier increases their own production. Inelastic demand motivates businesses to raise prices to increase revenue. When demand is elastic, then increasing supply will actually increase revenue because P2 multiplied by Q2 is less than P1 multiplied by Q1. But when demand is inelastic, then the exact opposite occurs. Revenue can actually be increased by decreasing supplies from S2 to S1. Much of the inflation that occurred during the 1970s was caused by the OPEC countries when they decided to raise the price of oil to increase their revenue. Because the demand for oil was inelastic, the OPEC countries could increase both the revenue and their profits by raising prices. Oil is needed for the production of most goods and for the provision of most services. So increasing the price of oil increased the price of just about everything that depended on oil. It was commonly believed that low employment leads to higher inflation. So the Federal Reserve tried to optimize the employment rate to what many believe is the natural unemployment rate. Lowering the unemployment rate further increases inflation as can be seen from the short run Phillips curve in the diagram on the right, which charts this theoretical relationship between unemployment and inflation. However, many economists believe that this relationship is less tenuous than formerly believed. Demand pool inflation occurs when an increase in demand 
occurs quickly or when the surge in demand is significant. A quickly increasing demand is reflected in a higher velocity of money. A surge in demand can be caused by an increase in aggregate demand, which is the total demand of goods and services in an economy. Increasing the money supply may increase inflation by increasing aggregate demand. How fast money changes hands per unit of time is called the velocity of money. A higher velocity of money means that it is spent faster, which will cause higher inflation. As you can see in this chart, a faster money velocity increases inflation. Money velocity greatly increased from 1978 to 1980, partly causing the inflation rate to exceed 14%. Here's another chart showing the great inflation during the 1970s. Most of this was caused by the greatly increased price of oil, which increased the price of everything else. An increase in aggregate demand or an increase in the velocity of money will only cause inflation if economic output is near or beyond its potential output. Potential output is what the economy can produce when its resources are used at normal rates. This is considered the maximum sustainable output. The aggregate amount is the amount actually produced. Potential output is not the greatest output by an economy, but it is the greatest output possible without straining economic resources, such as requiring overtime labor. Over time, labor and capital increase and technology improves, increasing both economic efficiency and economic output which reduces the inflation rate. An increase in aggregate demand will only increase inflation if the economy is above its potential output, which is represented by this line here. If the economy is less than its potential output, then an increase in demand will have little effect on prices, as you see here, because businesses already had a lot of slack in their use of resources so that they can easily increase production without significantly increasing costs. However, when the economic output is above potential output, then an increase in aggregate demand will increase prices significantly because businesses can only increase production by paying significantly more to increase their output, such as paying overtime to their workers, as you can see here. Many people, even the famed economist Milton Friedman, believe that increasing the money supply will increase inflation. But it depends on who gets it and what they do with it, and on how much and how fast they spend it for consumer goods and services. Inflation only increases when people spend money. The more they spend and the faster they spend, the more inflation increases. How much of income is spent rather than save or invest it depends on the consumer's propensity to consume. The proportion of additional income received by a consumer that is spent is called the marginal propensity to consume. The poor and the lower middle class tend to spend all of their income because they need all of their income to pay for essential goods and services, as you can see in the first part of the graph. Wealthy people spend less of their income Instead, they invest more of their income buying assets such as art, stocks, and real estate. So the graph for their marginal propensity to consume is flatter. That's going to be seen in the right part of, the, uh, of this graph. Thus, increasing the money supply will cause less inflation if more of it goes to wealthier people, as it usually does. Non-wealthy people spend a greater proportion of their income than wealthy people. Whether an increase in the money supply will increase inflation depends on whether the wealthy or the non-wealthy receive most of it. Since the non-wealthy have a greater propensity to consume, they will spend more of the money they receive, which may cause inflation to increase depending on where the economy is with respect to its potential output. When the wealthy receive a greater proportion of the total money supply, then the inflation of consumer prices will be less. Instead, inflation increases for those things that the wealthy buy or invest in, such as art or stocks. This is why the stock market increased significantly 
and record prices were being paid for art after the major tax cuts for the wealthy were passed in 2007. Unspent money does not contribute to inflation, no matter how much it is. So if the proverbial grandma gets more money and stuffs it in her proverbial mattress, or even destroys it, then that money will not be spent, so it will not contribute to inflation. As you can see in this graph, the money supply increased during and after the Great Recession and also during the COVID-19 pandemic. This graph shows the monthly changes in the consumer price index from 2001 up to 2021. Inflation did increase when the Fed increased the money supply after the Great Recession, but then it subsided from 2011 to 2016. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, governments started massively increasing the money supply again, which ignited inflation again. Will it subside again? That's the big question. When inflation is high, investments in hard assets, such as commodities and real estate, usually do well. However, the stock and bond markets suffer. The stock market suffers because people withdraw their money to pay higher prices for consumer goods and services and to pay for hard assets, such as real estate, or they withdraw their money just to pay their bills. This is why the stock market declined significantly when the economy shut down during the COVID-19 pandemic. People lost their jobs, so they were forced to liquidate their investments to continue paying their bills. Uncertainty about future inflation causes anxiety, so people tend to hoard cash to prepare for an uncertain future. Bonds suffer because a higher inflation rate lowers the real return of bonds, so bond investors demand a higher return to compensate for the inflation. Thus, bonds decline in price because bond prices change inversely to their yields, as you can see in this graph on the right. Inflation has skyrocketed during the spring and summer of 2021, as the world has emerged from the COVID-19 pandemic. Much of this inflation resulted from the sudden release of pent-up demand, along with the distribution of government stimulus checks to people who are more apt to spend it. Distributing several trillion dollars to the non-wealthy is a good way to ignite inflation. Of course, they needed it. During and after the COVID-19 pandemic, people were concerned about inflation since the Federal Reserve printed a lot more money. Inflation did spike in 2021, but the Federal Reserve assured people that it was probably temporary. Unable to spend it, people saved their money during the pandemic. When the pandemic ended, people quickly spent their savings for recreation, travel, and to do all the other things they were unable to do during the pandemic. A quick return to the new normal quickly increases aggregate demand and inflation. So how will this end? Many people try to predict inflation, but they are usually wrong. And those who are right were just lucky. Many people predicate their predictions on how much money the government is printing. But as we saw, increasing the money supply does not necessarily lead to higher inflation. While central banks, such as the Federal Reserve, publish how much money they are creating, information about the other factors affecting inflation in the near future is unknown. Economic indicators lag by several months. How quickly technology will mitigate inflation is unknown. How much money will go into cryptocurrencies or other investments was also unknown. No real-time statistics on the distribution of an increased money supply between the wealthy and the non-wealthy. It even takes time to measure inflation itself. So there are no statistics on the current month, but only estimates. People will satisfy their pent-up demand, and the distribution of government stimulus money has already ended. So at least these two factors point to an increase in inflation that is temporary. It should certainly subside from where it is now, even if it does not drop below 2% its previous rate. Much of today's inflation is probably transitory. Inflation is higher now because of a lower previous 12-month base, when inflation dropped significantly after the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Transitory inflation is also caused by frequent production bottlenecks as the world emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic. The Federal Reserve has adopted a new flexible average inflation strategy, committing to overshoot its 2% inflation target, at least temporarily, to achieve full employment, but continuing to maintain the average around 2%. Nonetheless, new technology, including robotics and the increasing use of automation, will help to mitigate inflation. Purchases of cryptocurrency and other investments also helps to reduce inflation. Since cryptocurrency is not spendable, the money spent for cryptocurrency is money not spent to buy consumer goods and services. Businesses will also better adapt to the new normal by increasing their efficiency which will take time. The best way to reduce inflation now and avoid overpaying is by being patient, by avoiding any spending frenzy. So for instance, if you wanna buy a house or a new or used car or truck, you could probably save a lot of money by waiting until next year. Some prices are starting to retreat. For instance, lumber prices skyrocketed during the pandemic but are now receding, as you can see in the graph to the right. Skyrocketing lumber prices also greatly increase prices for things that depend on lumber, such as new houses, which have also increased dramatically this year. Many prices will continue to decline, but they probably will not return to their previous level. Thank you very much for your time. If you liked my video, please subscribe. I would appreciate any suggestions so please leave them in the comments below. Also, check out my website at thismatter.com and my books at williamspalding.com to continue your financial education. Thank you.